Hello. So, um, AEMT Chapter 39, Abdominal Trauma. This is what we're going to concentrate on for this program. Actually, make it work. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so abdominal trauma. Uh, again, welcome from underneath the awning at Ortona State Park, uh, Ortona uh, South, which is a Corps of Engineers park on the Caloosahatchee River. It's rapidly approaching 85 degrees at 1.15 in the afternoon. Ooh, it's a little warm. All right, so let's talk about abdominal trauma. Um, this slide kind of says it all. When I was looking for some information a year or two ago to develop a little more in-depth um, trauma program, <clears throat> I found a quote in the um, textbook for University of California at LA, uh, UCLA's emergency physician program. So these are already doctors. They're specializing in ER medicine and this this paragraph basically said um, that distracting injuries alcohol and other intoxicants mask abdominal trauma and that abdominal trauma even for a trained ER physician with all the tools that they have is one of the easiest things to miss okay so these guys have already been to school between eight and 10 years, right? Um, total between, um, you know, their bachelor's in whatever, bio, whatever, right? And then medical school, and then some residency. And these professors were preaching to them how easy it is to miss intra-abdominal trauma, okay? Even with all the tools they have. So we're, we're way behind the curve on that. So I just I want you to think about that when you've got a patient with a mechanism of injury um, that, rec that suggests abdominal injury. They, they may not be complaining of it. Uh, I've talked many times about our pre-medicated patients, right? Those are the ones who medicated themselves prior to the event, right? Maybe with Percocet, uh, you know, they've got a, a, a Percocet addiction or heroin or fentanyl or carfentanyl or morphine or Dilaudid or whatever it is that they're taking. Um, those are wonderful pain meds. So a lot of times these symptoms are masked, uh, much less alcohol, right? Alcohol certainly will mask uh, pain as well. <clears throat> so high index of suspicion. Um, I preach all, all the time about recognizing compensated shock. Okay, um, or the signs that point us towards they're starting to become hypoperfused and they're starting down the path of shock, All right? The, the skin changes, uh, the tachycardia is a little bit of tachypnea, a little bit of anxiety, okay? Um, pain, certainly, tenderness, just a little sore, a little achy, ah, you know, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal, okay? We may not see anything externally. Um, no, no DKPTLS, right? No deformities, contusions, abrasions, bruises, nothing. Because you got to think about how much tissue lies between that leaking blood vessel and the mesentery, right? And, and their colon, around their colon. How much tissue there is between that and the outside of the skin, okay? Uh, penetrating and blunt trauma certainly are um, the, uh, the uh, issues here. Now, a little bit of a lining and compartment um, refresher here. So retroperitoneal is behind the abdominal cavity. The intraperitoneal cavity is what we think of as the abdomen. It's, it's got, you know, the stomach most of the intestines. It's got the liver, it's got the spleen, okay? But the, if you look, 
anything back here near the spine is retro peritoneal behind that peritoneal cavity, including the aorta, including the vena cava and the kidneys. <clears throat> now, we think of abdominal and pelvic. You can run them together because, I mean, they really do, I mean, it's just an imaginary boundary, but um, circulatory, digestive, the endocrine system lives there, the reproductive system, uh, lymphatic system, remember that's kind of um, our, our infection fighting system, right? And filter system. And then our urinary tracts and urinary systems. Now, mesenteries are this um, kind of super slippery, shiny, high blood flow lining around everything. Um, if you've ever been hunting and field dressed, say, a deer, then you've seen this. When you, if you gut a deer correctly, right, you make the cut from the rectum to the sternum and you don't cut too deep then the whole abdominal cavity, all that stuff just comes out in one big slimy, slippery, icky bag on the ground, okay? Um, peritoneum, thin double layered lining. So we have visceral and, and, and pleural um, peritoneum. The visceral covers the organs itself. That's one of those double layered. And the other one is against the abdominal wall, the outside system, okay? We split the abdomen into four quadrants. You can find different diagrams in different books like um, ana anatomic, anatomical, the biology guys, right, who want to split things down even more will, I've seen it broken down into nine sections. That's a little much for us, okay? Medicine uses four quadrants. Quad for four, okay? And they are equally spaced. So midline, from your nose down through your neck all the way down to your uh, um, sexual organs, external organs, right? Um, midline divides left to right. Roughly, if you were a reg, not regular, if you were a thinner, more normal BMI person, male or female, that upper and lower would be through roughly where your belly button should be, okay? You can't go with that though when the person weighs 400 pounds because their belly button is gonna be hanging somewhere down below their belt line, okay? Um, people who have had um, plastic surgery, the tummy tucks and things like that, Man, oh man! Some of these people don't even have belly buttons anymore. They, I mean, they literally take them right out when they make the, when they do the procedure. And other, they get put back, in place. And they, so, anyways, just picture that X, that that cross, <clears throat> being just right around to just above the belly button. Okay, right upper quadrant. You got your liver. Now, two lobes of the liver. The big lobe, the biggest part, sits in the right upper quadrant, but the smaller lobe sits over here in the left upper quadrant. You can see the esophagus comes down to the stomach, which sits mostly left upper quadrant, although a little bit's right. Then you can see the small intestine starts down here in behind the large intestine or the colon, and the small intestine goes through all the quadrants, right? And then connects here, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, okay? Over here, we also have our spleen. Uh, the pancreas runs between both upper quadrants. The gallbladder sits in the right upper. In the lower quadrants in a guy, hmm, you know, it's the appendix. Um, everything else, you know, is uh, bladder sits dead in the middle lower down in the pelvic area. Uh, females, though, have the differences in the lower quadrants. You know, they've got um, um, ovaries and fallopian tubes and their uterus splits the middle, okay? So <clears throat> we, and don't forget the diaphragm sits here. It starts here, roughly here, 
goes up and over the liver and back down to here. So, you know, any injury could involve the diaphragm as well. And remember, it comes up behind the liver also. So you could have a diaphragmatic injury. There's an opening in the diaphragm right here for the um, esophagus to go through. You could have a rupture of that hole, so diaphragmatic rupture, and you could end up with the stomach up in the lungs. Um, I've seen that a couple of times, and they are not breathing so well, right? Um, they're pretty short of breath because that left lower lobe in their lung, um, of which there's only two on the left side, has been displaced and smushed up. So. <clears throat> Retroperitoneal again behind that peritoneum. Kidneys, uh, the ureters, uh, because they go from the kidneys to the bladder. Uh, the duodenum, so part of the small intestine. Um, the colon, uh, pancreas. Organs in the belly, classified as hollow or, so hollow or solid. Okay, so hollow organs are not as vascular. They don't have as much blood flow. Uh, probably the primary one in the stomach is the intestines both small and large, okay? Um, but around them, there is a lot of vasculature because you, you gotta think about the fact that the intestines absorb nutrients up high in the small intestine and they absorb fluid down low in the um, uh, large intestine in the colon. So there's still a lot of vasculature around them. Solid organs though are not elastic and highly vascular, think kidneys, all right, think spleen, boom. Um, you damage those, severe bleeding, surgical in intervention is rapidly required. <clears throat> so the hollow organs, stomach, intestines, ureters, gallbladder, bile ducts, and bladder, solids, liver, spleen, kidneys, pancreas. All right, if you think about these, the solid organs, either secrete or filter or both. A hollow organs absorb and or distribute and excrete, right? So they move things around, they absorb some things here and there, and they get rid of whatever waste they can't use. So the kidneys, right, are responsible for, amongst many things, um, uh, uh, fluid balance, right? Fluid retention, fluid loss, um, you know, right, a balance. So whatever the body doesn't need, it excretes. Otherwise, it distributes it back out into the bloodstream. Toxins, it gets rid of toxins, excretes those. The stomach absorbs and then transports down the line, I mean, starts to break down the food, I'm sorry, into uh, a usable form that the intestines and can then, can then, I'm having trouble speaking, can then absorb what they need for where the food is and then pass on what they're not using, okay? Kids do not have enough musculature in the belly to provide adequate protection. Okay, so a punch to a 18 year old male is going to be better absorbed without injury than a that same punch to a six year old boy. Okay. So that punch could be a human punch with a fist or it could be a punch with a bicycle handlebars. It could be a stump because they fell running. It could be whatever, right? So um, think about that. The liver in kids are larger proportionately than it is in adults. So therefore it's at higher risk to be damaged. Mechanism of injury, you, you gotta have this high index of suspicion. Uh, please, you know, be aggressive with that. It is better to look at anybody, much less a seven-year-old, and say, ooh, I think he's a trauma team activation, or I think he's a trauma alert, 
and I'm going to take him to Portsmouth than it is to go, eh, I'm just, eh, he's fine. I'll take him to Exeter and have the kid die. Okay. That's better to be wrong taking him to the trauma center when he doesn't need it than it is to be wrong taking him to Exeter when he does need Portsmouth. Okay. So I would rather be wrong when it's right, <laughs> you know? I mean, if you're wrong and under triage this kid to a local ER and he dies, you know, that's on us. Um, worst case, you take somebody to a trauma center that doesn't need it and they'll go, eh, whatever, we needed the numbers. Now, look around for objects that could have caused injury. Um, as far as vehicles go, you know, look at seatbelts, dashboards, steering wheels, um, uh, armrests, objects that might have been flying around the vehicle. Uh, if you're on a motorcycle and you rear end somebody, you're, you're going to travel forward until you meet resistance and then you're thrown up and over. So you know, I'm looking at my motorcycle right now. I'm going to go right up the tank and I'm going to catch the handlebars right in the pelvis. Um, and then the little windshield I have right in the stomach. So lots of injuries potentially there. How fast? What was involved for vehicles? Um, if there was more than one vehicle, what angles were they going at when they connected and how fast were they going? Um, was it head on? So 55 and 55 head on, 110 miles an hour combined speed versus um, I was going 20 miles an hour through the intersection and I got rear-ended from behind at 40. Well, 40 minus 20, you know, he hit me at 20 miles an hour, basically. That's the impact I took, okay? Did they get ejected completely or partially? Um, did they have seat belts on, shoulder belts? Uh, were they in car seats or booster seats appropriately, okay? Uh, and what path did they take? So in a car, we have what's known as uh, down and under or up and over. So you can end up going down under the steering wheel. You're going to shatter your knees. That force is now going to be an indirect impacts on your femurs, your hips, your pelvis. Um, you're also going to take your stomach on the um, stomach and chest, possibly on the bottom of the steering wheel. Up and overs. Your femurs catch the bottom, femurs and pelvis catch the bottom of the steering wheel. And your face takes the windshield, which then hyper extends it and transmits force down your neck. Your hands are on the steering wheel. That force comes back through to your elbows and shoulders. Um, <clears throat> are there any deformities to the steering wheel? How about the windshield? How about the dashboard? Um, handlebars on a motorcycle, handlebars on a bicycle. Okay. So any mechanism of injury that you can imagine leads to belly trauma. Okay. As far as position of comfort for these folks, curled up in a ball, that's how you find a lot of these people. Um, they don't want to lay flat because when you lay somebody flat, it, it pulls on the peritoneum, okay, on that peritoneal lining. And when you pull on that lining, you are creating stress on it and stretching it, and it causes pain. So if you can, <clears throat> having them lay on their side with their knees curled up is fine. Um, otherwise, if you've got to transport them supine because you're worried about their spine or something, you can lift their knees up and put some pillows under it, and that will take some of that tension off their uh, abdominal wall. Now, belly, right? They've absorbed a bunch of energy. Um, you got to think about C-spine. Uh, you got to think about all the bleeding that can go on in there and uh, spinal, right? You can have spinal injuries with abdominal trauma and then you can have neurogenic shock and hypovolemic shock, right? So look at them, you know, as you're walking up to them, what's their color, right? What do I see here and smell? What's their color look like? Do they look pale? Um, are they sweating profusely even though it's 50 degrees out? Um, and are they clammy to the touch? Uh, if you're agitated and you're in pain and 
hemodynamically stable. Having a blood pressure that's a little bit higher than normal makes perfect sense because you're in pain. Um, blood pressures go up with pain. So if your blood pressure is going up and you're not bleeding, you would ex you can be pale because of pain, but you could also be kind of flushed because you're anxious and upset and your adrenaline's flowing. Okay, so but look at them. What do they look like? You look at them and go, oh shit, that's a trauma center. Okay, don't overthink this stuff. You look at them and go, well, if my partner sat down right beside him. They look the same, then your patient's probably okay. But if you look at the patient and go, ugh, well, I'm glad that's not me, trauma center. Now, <clears throat> what are their chief complaints? And don't, their belly might not be their chief complaint. That smashed up ankle that's just killing them could be masking the symptoms that they would otherwise be feeling with their belly. Okay? They're broken humerus. All right? Um, what are their chief complaints? What are their other injuries? Um, when you get to the belly, palpate all four quadrants. The one area that hurts, you palpate last. Because if you go pushing on that early, then you can overwhelm the rest of the pain system and something else might hurt more, but they don't feel it now. Okay? And remember, push in slow over about a second or two. Just both hands, the, the fingers, Fingertips on the hand, push in slow and go, hey, how's that feel? Uh, that was okay. And then let off quick. How about that? All right. We're looking for pain on palpation going in, letting off real quick. We're looking for rebound tenderness, which tells us they've got stuff leaking inside that peritoneal cavity. Okay. Trauma, evisceration. We talked a little bit about eviscerations the other night with uh, um, our, our wound care. We're going to see some really good examples of this shortly. And they're, I mean, they're moulage, which is fake makeup, you know, injuries, but they look very accurate. Um, the whole big, oh, just 27 feet of intestines hanging on the ground is not very realistic for the majority of what we see. Um, sure, you've got a Humvee that hits an IED in Baghdad. Yeah, you could have all kinds of major eviscerations. Um, luckily, thank God, we're not seeing that stuff um, here in the U.S. on a regular basis. Our motor vehicle accidents are, are falls off a ladder while using a chainsaw. I mean, we, we see small ones occasionally. Um, and, and I mean, to the point where the first one I ever saw, I couldn't tell if it was a loop of intestine or whether it was just some fatty tissue, some subcutaneous tissue from his gut. You know, I, I couldn't tell. Uh, they look a lot alike. Remember the abdomen and the pelvis will hold a ton of blood before it becomes apparent. If you have distension, right? We talked about this with assessment that fat guys have big bellies, right? But when you push on it, it's soft and squishy, right? You push on it, and, but if you think about a drum head, right? Um, um, doesn't matter what drummer you think of and what rock band you like um, or whatever band you like, when they hit that drum head, that drum skin, that is tight. It, that's what allows it to give off that music. The abdomen's the same way. If it's distended, then that skin is tight. And you can actually tap on it and hear different sounds. So like if you've got a big fat guy and you just kind of tap on his, his, um, his stomach wall, you put a couple of fingers down on the skin and then with your other hand, you tap on top of your fingers, you'll just kind of hear this dull kind of just basically skin hitting skin, right? But if you tap that and you get this kind of high resonance drum-like sound, who that's distended, you've got either air or fluid in underneath that. Okay, so if it's tight and it doesn't want to jiggle, you got to worry about distension. Um, the other day I had a patient who had some CHF going on, but I also thought he had a blood clot going on in his lungs, and but his belly was big, and I, I just, you know, his legs were super swollen, 
So I was trying to decide whether he had some edema in his belly as well. And so, you know, I, I asked him, I said, hey, um, is your belly, how does your belly look to you? Does it, is it, you know, usually this big or is it usually a little bit smaller? And they're, people are pretty honest about it. They go, oh, no, that's, that's pretty swollen. Okay. So ask if you can't tell. <clears throat> um, DCAP BTLS, right? Our, our contusions, our lax, our penetrations, pain, tenderness, distension. Um, they're in a position of comfort when you get there. They're, you're sitting in a chair curled up in a ball leaning over, right, with their hands on their knees, or they're lying in bed curled up on their side. Okay? You can have some, so ecchymosis, big fancy term for bruising, to the flanks or the belly button area. These are late findings though. Um, like, I mean, you could have it within 20 or 30 minutes, but that would be a significant injury, um, significant. You can also have it hours to days later. Okay? And it's just a collection of blood from wherever it's bleeding. Okay, and your mechanism of injury. Now, Kerr's sign is referred pain to the left shoulder. So if you're having diaphragmatic issues, pain with the diaphragm, irritation with the diaphragm, you get some left shoulder pain with that. That's pretty common. Um, abdominal guarding. So let's say your stomach hurt and I wanted to push on it to find out. You would tighten up your muscles, subconsciously tighten up your, your abdominal muscles so that I can't push on it. You're guarding against me hurting you. Okay? ABCs and with the C, you get the shock. Um, if you miss this, they can die. Now, shooting, shooting stabbings, just generalized all around ass kickings. Um, motor vehicle accidents potentially are a crime scene also. Okay, so um, be careful with what you do at these scenes. If you do something, let the police know. If you have a hole in a shirt, do not cut through that hole. So we want to cut clothes off these people who've been shot, right? But go around the holes because you can, that, that hole is evidence and you can uh, damage that evidence. Which could make it harder for them to prove a case, prove somebody innocent, prove somebody guilty too. Okay. Blunt trauma is most common and mortality is about 30%. That's kind of scary. Three out of 10. Now this is not just your, oh, I got punched in the gut, right? This is your big belly trauma. 30% of them die, three out of 10. Open injuries are certainly easier to find than um, our closed injuries. You gotta, be, you gotta be on your game when the belly's closed. I mean, it's easy. It's all. It's easy to overlook, by the way, stab wounds and gunshot wounds, because a lot of these guns that we use in society nowadays have small bullets. You know, the AR-15 platform, M16, M4 platform, whatever you want to think of it as, fires a very small bullet, a 22, basically a 22 bullet, at a super high rate of speed. Um, I've seen a couple of these wounds. And they're hard to see if you're not looking for them. Um, one of them, we thought they were dog bites because the guy had also been bitten by the trooper's dog several times. So we thought a couple of these holes initially were dog bites or canine teeth, you know. Um, and the other thing is that um, I saw a 22 hole once from a, so a regular 22 caliber gun. Um, and we couldn't see the hole. We, the, the, the Guy put the pistol to his roommate's chest, but it was pointed down, not straight in. So it looked like just a like a little trench, like the bullet kind of scraped through some of the um, epidermis and didn't go in. But we took one of those long Q-tips that you know I talked about in the uh, CSMs, um, and we actually turned the Q-tip and ran it down that little trench of. Uh, trench in the skin and slipped right into his chest. So, and we'd been looking for this thing for an hour, 
the surgeon was arguing with us. He hasn't been shot. There's a bullet in his chest x-ray in his chest. The guy's going, he must have swallowed it. We're like, oh, horse shit. Um, so, it, so it can be that difficult, okay? High index of suspicion. You've got something that could be a hole, cover it. So this is a great, uh, this is an actual evisceration, okay? Um, so evisceration isn't just intestinal. So any stomach contents that are protruding out. So this is basically fatty tissue, okay? Same thing, we want to protect it. We want to put a uh, wet dressing over it and then um, something um, that's uh, like saran wrap kind of thing, you know, that, that will keep it from drying out. Penetrating trauma, try to find out what it was, okay? Was it a knife? Was it, um, so here's something for you young folks called an ice pick. So back before my day, they used to buy blocks of ice and um, they would chip chunks of ice off with ice picks, basically a sharp screwdriver, um, sharp pointy screwdriver. Um, and because all these houses had ice picks to break apart ice to make drinks with, um, they were handy and people used to get stabbed with ice picks a lot. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> it could be a screwdriver. It could be a fall onto a screwdriver, okay? Could be knives, um, guns. Finding out what the gun was and what caliber it was is nice, but trust me, most of the surgeons, even if they were in the military, they don't know shit about ballistics, okay? They don't know that a 5.56 five, and a 2.23 are the same thing, or that a 5.56 five, five, and a 9 millimeter are different sizes, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, but it would be nice to know, high caliber, you know, versus uh, a handgun. Evisceration, any sort of organ protruding. Here's another example of it. Um, this is moulage here, but um, because trust me, if he was unconscious with blood and an evisceration, he would not be this pink and dry looking, right? So um, here's his injury. Cut away from it. You know, we've got great moulage here. That is one of those multi-trauma dressings, nah, 10 by 30 inches, 10. Um, by 30 long, soak it down with some sterile water or sterile saline, put it over the evisceration, and then wrap it with something. So in this case, this is actually the plastic cover that comes on this dressing. So that works really well if it's big enough. Um, and then, you know, this says, oh, secure it with tape or cravats, whatever you can do to cover. This is not sealing like to keep air out, this is just to keep this moisture in, to keep that loop or tissue um, moist and healthy. Impaled objects, do not remove them. Um, you may, you know, I drew that on the board where we had that like fish hook looking stick. It may have gone in and caused zero collateral damage other than the tissues it physically, you know, tore through but coming out, you may hook something else and cause significant injury. We'll stabilize it in place. With our blunt trauma, we're worried about internal bleeding, especially that we don't recognize. Um, and certainly it can be direct injury. It could also be indirect. ABCs, shock, take them to a trauma center. Now diaphragmatic, <clears throat> diaphragm, right, primary respiratory muscle for ventilation. We already have hole in it, right? We have hole in it for our esophagus to go down through. You can rupture, expand that hole. You can tear that hole and make it bigger. You could also tear other holes in it. Um, besides the fact that you can have like loops of intestine or your stomach gets stuck up in that, um, blood flow gets cut off, it becomes ischemic. Now it's a major surgical event. They also get acutely short of breath. Uh, I went to a motor vehicle accident once. This was back when we had to backboard everybody. Um, AMR, in fact, had just sent a letter out saying, if you don't backboard everybody, we're going to fire you. Um, and I had a patient who was walking around the scene. He'd driven off the road through a bunch of little tiny saplings, but I got to backboard him. So I explained what we were going to do. He said, okay. And we did a standing takedown on him. 
The second we laid him flat, he took a gasp of air, turned blue and stopped breathing. And I almost shit myself. I'm like, get him up, get him up, get him up. And you sit him up, get the board out from behind him, sit the stretcher up. And he goes, <gasps> and starts taking these really shallow, ragged breaths. And um, non-rebreather, took about 15 minutes to get him kind of pink again. And boom, he's a trauma team activation. Um, we get him there. He gets a portable chest x-ray immediately. Like he's still on our structure and they do a portable chest. And um, his stomach is partway up into his um, chest wall, into his thorax. He had this herniation. And, and when I sat him up, I'm like, oh my God, has that ever happened to you before? Goes, oh yeah, I can't sleep laying flat. I've been sleeping in my chair for years. Every time I lay down, I get short of breath. Like, then why didn't you tell me that? I told you I was going to put you on a board and lay you flat. Oh, I didn't think of it. So he had this big um, hiatal hernia. So this big, her big herniation in that opening for his um, esophagus. And when I laid him flat, his stomach went and got stuck up in there. Sitting him up allowed, even though the stomach was stuck in there, it allowed the diaphragm to come down a little bit, allowed, took the weight of the abdominal organs off the diaphragm and allowed him to breathe eh, better. Now deceleration, objects stay in motion until they are acted upon by an outside force. So you're in your car, that car will continue to move until you either apply the brakes or you let off the gas and the compression within the motor eats that energy and slows you down. Or you hit that big ass tree, okay? The slower you slow down, the less injured you become. Okay? So the faster you decelerate, the more injured you become. There are three impacts that go on with every accident. Okay? You have the impact of you hitting the, right? Um, so your car hits the tree. You then hit the steering wheel. Your internal organs then hit the inside of your chest wall. Now you get flipped backwards back in your seat and the organs go sloshing back the other way. But vehicle impact, you into the vehicle and then your organs into you. Um, explosion injuries are often besides the um, shock wave of the blast, which can disrupt organs, um, cause traumatic brain injury, the whole works. You also have um, the debris that goes with it. So you have blunt trauma from, the sh from that pressure, from that shock wave. Then you have penetrating injuries from the debris, the shrapnel, you know, what the bomb was made of, whatever. Um, and then you have contamination because the um, ground that this thing was in is full of nasty, filthy dirt and cigarette butts and trash and all that shit. And now that's inside your abdominal cavity. Okay, so the thing, kind of the biggest thing I can say to you is um, please use your thinker, use your brain and um, have a high index of suspicion, do a really good exam on these folks and be aggressive. If you go, eh, then they should probably go to a trauma center. Um, so that's our um, AEMT chapter on abdominal injuries. Um, I'll see you next time.